Hello, and welcome to the Long Island Local Podcast, brought to you by Audio Workstations here in Bohemia, New York. Let's jump right into the conversation with a Long Island local business owner. Welcome, everyone, to the Long Island Local Podcast. We are here in season two learning about local businesses. And today we have with us Elisa Valentino, who is a life strategist and divorce coach. Elisa, welcome to the podcast. Thank you for being here. It's my pleasure to be here today. Well, I'm excited to learn more about life strategizing because I think everyone needs a good strategy. Sometimes I think we just we just go on autopilot and don't stop and actually maybe write some things down and gather our thoughts for where we're headed, where we're going, what's next. So I'm going to go ahead and imagine that life strategist implies helping people do this. Is, is that correct? It is. And, uh, you know, a little kind of a statement that I always like to say is if you're if you're planning to take a train somewhere, you don't just go up and say, give me any ticket. You usually have a destination in mind where you're looking to go, and that's how you buy your ticket, and that's how you get where you're going. So it's kind of the same thing with life. It's kind of having a plan, a very definitive and deliberate way of mm. where you want your life to go. And that's what I help people do, figure out their goals. And um, I do that with people just in general with their life, but also particularly one of the niches that I have is in the area of divorce and working with people that are going through the divorce process, helping them navigate and then figure out where they're going post-divorce. Okay, I see. So the divorce coaching is like a specialty within life strategist and it's like a, a niche that you found that you can be extra helpful for people who yes. are going through that specifically. Okay. All right. I want to come back to that, but first I want to go a little bit broader on on being a life strategist because I'm curious how much of people's goals that they're searching for making a goal or, or searching for the destination of their goal is uh, business versus personal and how that sort of intertwines with people. So I think that they very much intertwine and go hand in hand and they can. And many times you may have several goals or several strategies about your life. You know, you have your personal life and you have your business life. And for some people, depending on where it might be in their life that they feel a lacking or somewhere that they want they see themselves but they just can't seem to get there it's mm -hmm. kind of like that new year's resolution we all make them and then it's like well why didn't i follow through it's not that we don't know what we want a lot of times we haven't really put a plan into effect to get us there right. with goals and action steps and having accountability so it really depends on the individual. Sometimes, you know, they, they go hand in hand, uh, particularly when you're looking at people that are going through divorce sometimes, and I'm going to generalize when I speak. So, sure. you know, but it might be, say, a woman or, you know, that's been home and she's been a homemaker and she's been a mom and a domestic engineer, but now she's gone through a divorce and she has to say, well, you know, I may have to think about working now, but what do I want to do? And then how do I how do I bridge that between being a mom and being a work you know someone in the workforce? So the per and then where do I want to go with my life? Maybe I want to find a new partner. So the life, the business, it all kind of does you know intercept together. Yeah, that makes sense. Yeah, and you mentioned accountability, and I think that's probably the the yeah. key to the whole thing right because there's something about reporting to only yourself for tasks yeah. that you've assigned yourself where you can give yourself more time you can you you can allow yourself to procrastinate um, often I feel like uh, goals and aspirations that we develop for ourselves are uh, stay in our inner monologue a bit and they don't get uh, either verbalized or written down or shared with others to the point where there can be any form of accountability. Yeah, very and, true. Yeah, and so I feel like is 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 that just a big part of it? Is is having a, another human being who's like, okay, I am also interested in what you're trying to achieve because I think a lot of the times we just feel like we're the only ones, right? It's, yes. it's it, when you're working on yourself. You're not on a team, it seems like, a lot of the times. Yeah, it's very true what you just said. And um, there's, um, when it comes to accountability, it's kind of like a, a two-prong process. So you, when you have somebody that's there, you 
have also like what I like to call a cheerleader because it's not always just about sort of, oh, I have to do this or I didn't do that or I messed up with this. It's also having someone there that can hold you accountable when you do good things. Like Mm -hmm. not many of us take the time to say, like we have a list maybe of 10 things and you get through, say, seven of them. You, You focus on, well, I didn't do the three. Right. But a coach also is there in addition to say, like, well, let's talk about, you know, what stopped you or what challenges got in the way or what, you know, didn't allow you to finish those other three on the list. But you did seven. And we're going to celebrate that. And I find that most people don't often pat themselves on the back and give them that themselves that reward and that celebration of saying, you know what? I had a list of 10. I did seven. Right. And look at how far I came from before I made this list. So a coach is there to not only, you know, we're only there to guide, to assist and to kind of be that. Uh, force that maybe helps you get over some of those challenges maybe you can't see yeah like how to get beyond it but yeah. we're objective and we see your strengths yeah. and then on the other hand when you do something great isn't it nice like my sessions will always start before there's any issues problems failures it's always about what are we celebrating this week mm-hmm. because there has to be a couple of things that you're really proud of and you want to talk about and you did great yeah it, I think it can be difficult to be self-congratulatory yeah i think there's a definitely a a social pressure against it because it's seen as like you know being too uh into yourself or, or being conceited yeah and it's really difficult to like navigate the fine line between thinking too much of yourself or giving yourself you know too much praise uh or not doing any at all and i feel like we we tend to want it to come from outside ourselves um but i do think that you can learn to be a little easier on yourself and and learn to self-congratulate without excusing yourself from doing anything but perfectly said and and you know part of i think you know one of the bigger bigger problems people have and i've noticed it uh whether whether it's people trying to set a goal for as simple as getting in better shape or you know getting their health and in on a better track a lot of times people really don't practice Mm self-kindness you know and that really has nothing to do with being conceited it's like so many times I, I hear people like the way they talk to themselves and then I say, wait, d- is there someone you can think of right now in your life that you really love and that you care about? Oh, yeah. You know, my sister, my friend, my husband, my wife. Would you ever say that to them? And it's like, no. Well, then why would you say that to yourself? Yeah. So I a lot of what happens in the coaching is also learning, like getting trained on self-kindness and when you're kinder to yourself, it, you're actually, because um, I do a lot in my practice with vibration raising, and um, which I can tell you a little bit about. Yeah. Um, but when we are in a really good place mentally, um, we're in a, a good feeling, kind of what we would call those light feelings, like happy, sure. compassionate, helpful. You know, when our vibration is very high, we're in such a different state than when we are in what I would call a low vibration, fear, lack, um, you know, self-denial, self-deprecation, all of those things um, that bring us into a higher vibration are all part of when we're kind to ourselves. And Mm. then that helps us to be kind to other people. And then as the vibration around us raises, the ultimate goal is that, you know, we're in kind of a state of love, we're in a state of compassion for one another. But if you don't know, or you don't practice being kind to yourself right it, it, you know that expression everything starts at home then how can you be like that you know with other people and how can you be um a a, a, a kind force in the world so um vibration it's coming a little bit more like you'll hear more and more people talk about and it's coming a little bit more into like the mainstream talking points but it's really all about physics and it's very science based and everything in our world is made of energy sure. and all energy vibrates and has a frequency and so the faster something vibrates the higher the frequency <laughs> so if you think in terms of a lower vibration like fear or worry, which many times people going through divorce or they're going through a tough time, they're in that state. Other things that vibrate at that low level are disease, sickness, 
you know, so we don't want to really stay in those states. We want to bring ourselves up into a higher vibration because we're going to generally feel better. We're going to exude a better energy and we're going to be able to um, attract with the whole law of attraction, those things that we're kind of putting out mm. there. And that's very important in terms of mindset, reaching goals, having, you know, being in that state. Yeah. A lot of what you're talking about has big crossover with studying audio, of course, because studying sound is a subset of studying physics. Yes. So understanding frequencies um, and the, the basic science behind how they work is a lot of what I had to teach and what we have to think about when we're thinking about audio. Um, and so I, I know what you mean in that sense. I was actually just watching a, um, a, a YouTube video where somebody was talking about, this is going to seem random, but it's going to come back around, sure. um, a Janet Jackson song that was known to break certain laptop hard drives and they Which were trying song? to it was rhythm nation oh, okay okay so i can't sing it because you know um copyright stuff but uh but i can hear it in my head that's important <laughs> and i hope the listeners can hear it in their head as well so um apparently there was a certain um combination of frequency and amplitude that would uh crash certain hard drives and this one youtuber was talking about why and it was um the fact that it wasn't in a standard uh e-tuning because the uh, it's in the key of E, and so there's a lot of bass notes playing that E, but other songs in E don't crash laptops, so why this one? Right. And it turned out that at that time, um, there was sort of a trend in the part of uh, music production we call mastering, which is when the song is basically finished, and they are treating it as just one left and right music stereo file that is going to go out to the public, and they're trying to polish it and improve it for that final distribution. Mm -hmm. And so there was common practice at the time to use this um, little uh, pitch adjuster that would technically speed up the song a little bit and increase the frequency of everything in the song a little bit because it was viewed as sounding more exciting than the original. Gotcha. Okay. And it was actually pretty, it's pretty extreme. It's not, it's not common anymore because it actually does change the tuning and it changes the tempo. And most artists aren't comfortable making that big of a shift that far into the process. Okay. But at that time in whenever the year was that they released that song, 80s, it, was a, think, it was a popular right? technique. I think it was either late eighties or early nineties. Yeah. So it was a popular technique and it just so happened that that particular frequency hitting over and over again just overloaded the hard drive enclosure of the laptop like the little metal box it vibrated too much wow. and it would ruin the the spinning mechanism of the hard drive and make it shake too much um and so that's why it's only that song because of the the nature of the baseline plus the fact that it was pitch shifted up a little bit interesting randomly matched the size and shape of a hard drive enclosure and not to get too far into audio science but created a resonant frequency where if you have a certain size and shape and then the audio bounces around that in enclosed space it can cause one particular frequency to overwhelm and become resonant and like run away with vibration. It's the same reason why you can, uh, with an opera singer or a rock singer, you can break glass with your yes. voice. If you hit the right frequency, sustain it for the right amount of time at the right amplitude so that the glass starts to shake a little bit and then it just keeps shaking and shaking because you don't stop exciting it with the wave that's hitting it. Yeah. It's a similar phenomenon why the hard drive crashed to why the glass will the break. Gla yeah. So it just happened to be tuned to the right note. I think that's such a great analogy because what it's showing is the power because, you know, we can't see these things. Sure. And so I think where we're coming kind of like just in general, like society in the world, I think people are starting to become more open to the idea that if I can't see it or hear it or, you know, sense it with any of my five senses, is it real? But well, we know germs are real at so, this point. <laughs> well, yes, and we know that the um, this whole idea of energy and the power that it has. So mm -hmm. it has. It's it's all like you said, science based and physics based. And so when we as humans, you know, are resonating at certain frequencies, there will be certain things that we're either attracting or putting out there sure. to either our benefit or our detriment. And um, and it's so important to let people know the power that they yeah. really have within themselves to bring themselves towards that happiness and the, the good stuff or to kind of allow themselves to... to continue or to allow themselves to fall deeper into mm -hmm. the negative. And that's not to say that some of these experiences people go through and the people I, I work with, they're not 
devastating experiences, but it doesn't mean you have to stay there. You have the power right. to move beyond that. You can retune your guitar string. Exactly. Yeah. Okay, that makes sense. Um, I had a thought, but it passed. I'm sure it'll come back to me. Okay. Oh, I know what my thought was. It's that brain waves have particular frequencies, and so I know that there are certain, like... Uh, uh, binaural beats and things yes. that have been proven to um, assist with getting your brain to be in a different uh, frequency of thought pattern or, or brainwave state like yes. there's sleep uh, there's frequencies that correlate to sleep and relaxation and being alert and so I've I haven't done this myself but I've heard a bit about it um, there's a another podcast out there in the world called Huberman Labs. It's a, a, a neuroscientist um, uh, by the name of Andrew Huberman, and he talks a lot about like things that have been you know, scientifically proven to uh, like change your brain state yeah. into from this one to the other if you want to be more productive or you want to get better sleep. He digs into the literature about how you could do that through certain practices, and a lot of it has to do with, you know, like the the waves that your brain is, is functioning yeah, at. So. I know like another one that's very similar to that and I kind of use it a lot and recommend it also um, when it comes to listening to um, whether it's music or or tones that are in the 432 hertz mm. because that's, that's... That's an interesting topic. Yes, it's very yes. interesting. We but, could rabbit hole that yes, one. Yes, <laughs> but the point like you're saying mm -hmm. is that all of these things do affect and the more we are aware of them the more we can kind of go in that direction to bring ourselves closer to where we feel happiness and we're you know kind of living the life that we want to live yeah yeah i think you do the you listen to the type of music that you like and if you consider your your life strategy a uh, type of music that you want to listen to you have to consciously change the radio station or tune the instrument differently yes. Think about it before you, you know, expect it to happen, I exactly. suppose. Okay, awesome. Let's move to the divorce coaching because that seems to be something that is a very particular niche to you because I don't know that I've heard it even used as a term before. And so mm -hmm. when you started to do that, did you find that there's other people out there doing it and competition or did you sort of invent a category and then be faced with the challenge of telling people that it exists like... Maybe well, we have here. yeah, so it, it's kind of interesting because um, what happened was just life experience wise, you know, I, I kind of had this really nice career. Then my early 30s, I got married and became a homemaker, decided to stay home, be a mom and left the career, you know, behind me. Um, Did was, you mention what that career was yet? Or yeah, no? I was in. Uh, no, I didn't. But okay. I was uh, I was in marketing and licensing and brand strategy and management. Okay. And uh, I did that you know, it was a family business. So I was involved since I was a teenager for like the next 15 years I or so. I noticed the word strategy popped up in yes, there too. Okay. Yes. I see a theme. Very much so. And, um, and so I did that. And then, you know, I got married and my husband at the time was, um, an attorney that actually worked within that industry. So, you know, as now that I'm a stay at home mom, you know, we kind of put all the effort into trying to build his practice right. and I'm a mom. Well, we unfortunately decided we were going to get a divorce. And though I had really hoped that it was going to be very, you know, f friendly, as friendly, I guess, as divorces can be, right. you know, to raise children together and that sort of thing. It unfortunately wasn't. It was very, very contentious. Mm. Um, it lasted two years. It was very traumatic on man many levels. It was the kind of thing where we had this very nice life, um, Hampton House, traveling to Europe, the whole thing. And he literally just walked out one day, you know, like, there was no communicating whatsoever. Wow. So I was obviously devastated, shocked. How am I going to be a sole parent? You know, um, financially, yes, you know, as divorce has, I, I was having alimony and child support and that kind of thing, but it doesn't last forever, mm -hmm. you know? So it's like, what am I going to do now? How am I going to do this? And one thing I was pretty adamant about within myself was that I said, you know, I really don't want to have to go back like, to the city or travel or get on planes. And I have two kids, I can't do that. Yeah. And this was pre-pandemic, so I, I did not, um, it wasn't the thing then to like work from home, but I said, I gotta figure out how to do this. Ahead of your time. Yeah, so, um, so what ended up happening is that through this very traumatic, upsetting process, 
I started developing some techniques and some ways that I was actually kind of coaching. I didn't know it, but I was sort of coaching myself through this whole process and developing some techniques and realizing, hey, if it, I, I should have, now that I'm aware of this, it helps me to understand that. And when I came through the process, I said, you know what, being that I don't want to go back into the field I was in, I would just want to help people. Like, what can I do? And... Um, I'm very, you know, spiritual person, um, also a light worker. And I was like, what can I, what, how do I make money, you know, doing that? And I realized I wanted to, I thought if I was in this situation, there has to be lots of other men and, you know, women and men. Mm -hmm. And I say women because obviously I was more thinking women right. at the time. But I said, no, there are ordinary people that are going through this. So what I realized was I wanted to actually help coach people through the divorce process because when you have an attorney the attorneys do what they do and they do it well they are looking at the legalities they're looking at the laws they're mm -hmm. looking at the rules they're looking at the timing all this stuff and most times you get to learn things on a need to know basis you don't really have like a bird's eye view what to expect how does this work what you know i i hear people all the time when they're mad like i'm going to take him to the cleaners or she's not getting anything and it's like well it just doesn't work like that yeah. you know here in new york there are rules and so what i did was i developed kind of like a two-phase program that i i said you know gee i think i could help attorneys because they're not there to kind of hold hands. Yeah, you know, I I actually did an interview with um, a divorce attorney yes. here on the podcast, and it was like it, it did seem tricky. It's like it, the people need someone else to talk to, but a lot of it falls outside of his professional purview. Yeah, and also it's not even professional purview. It's mm. like how can they do their job and then do another job? It's just it's Correct. just not practical. Yeah. So even if they're the kindest, most understanding person. So I realized at that time that um, there were a couple of issues that I felt people would maybe be better empowered if they understood a little bit more about what's to come mm -hmm. and what to expect, what not to expect, how to manage your expectations, what things you can start thinking about and working on during the process, and then very forward focused thinking. So for example, when people go through divorce or any kind of life change experience, they may need a therapist. And a therapist has a very useful and important uh, part of that person's healing. Particular toolkit that they use. Yes. But many times people don't necessarily need a therapist. They're not necessarily in any kind of conflict or dealing with very, you know, difficult issues. They may just need coaching, which is very yeah. thought and behavioral behavioral focused and they th what I do is once we kind of work through like phase one which is a little bit more of understanding the process of of seeing where you might fit in this process how to get through the particulars that you're going to encounter as you go then we move and it's kind of all weaved together but the other part of the process then becomes about the person their goals goal setting the support dealing with stress manage you know managing their stress and making um whether they wanted the divorce they didn't want the divorce the point is this is where you are yeah so we're not looking back if you have a lot of pain and a lot of grief you can work with a the therapist and yeah. that's a very you know very admirable thing to do but we are going to start from here and now we're going to just go forward and we're going to turn whatever lemons you have into lemonade yeah. and and create and strategize this new life for yourself. People who have children, um, you need to kind of get your own self in order because you want to be able to be as strong as you can, mm -hmm. you know, going forward for your children as well. And, you know, I always say in the ideal world of highest vibration, it, it would be nice if people could have a really nice divorce work together you're still a family in in certain ways and the more you can feel good about yourself and have a plan and be in a position where you know where you're going and what you want you know it helps to kind of quell a lot of the staying in victimhood and and being angry and then you can kind of be forward focused you know as individuals working together to you know raise your children or to just have really nice lives yeah. individual of each other I think when you're going through something that's uh, emotional, traumatic, intense, it takes up a lot of your energy yeah. just to sort of like, uh, you know, maintain, you know, your own sanity and, and feel like 
um, you know, you're you're still doing the things that you need to do on a daily basis just to to stay above water. But then there's often like you know things that you know you should be planning on a larger scale, but they're just yeah. hard to get to. Um, and it's hard to get outside your own um, perspective. Like if if I can sit here and think of three things that could be the next big move for my life. Those are the three things that I can think of. Right. But there could be someone who's not me, who's just like not stuck in my head, who could give me like three more options. Yeah, and draw, or, draw, or draw that out of you. Right. Sorry about that. No, you're that. okay. Uh, or draw that out of you, you know, where it might be there somewhere, but you haven't been able to access it. That's really what a coach does. You know, they're helping the person dig a little bit to find their own creativity and answers that they just haven't unleashed. You know, it's funny, just to go back a second, you said, like, w- is there a lot of competition? And I haven't really found any. I mean, I didn't kind of go into that because I thought, oh, this is a great opportunity. I kind of did it because I felt like, you know, there's probably people like me who could use someone when they're going through this. And I've I've gotten, you know, as I started doing it, I started to get like some really nice feedback from people, um, including attorneys who say, you know, that's that's really helpful because a lot of times people don't know how to harness all these these things. You know, they're fearful, they're mm-hmm. they're confused with your identity. And you said just before you have to continue doing, you know, the things you do. But what about now you have to do things you didn't have to do? Yeah. Like your dad. Like you maybe didn't have to cook or you didn't have to have a full weekend without mom there that you have your children or you're a mom who says, well, I didn't have to worry about figuring out the life insurance and, you know, the health insurance and taking out the garbage. So it's a really influx time that you're trying to redefine and and assimilate all these new things. No, it makes sense. I mean, there's lots of instances in which people want to like find the next phase in their life. But, you know, divorce being one of the the big stressors yes. right that's like a a, a a very specific place where your head is maybe kind of spinning and that that need for someone else to help guide you is is even more so there so i think that's excellent because um people will be feeling they're most lost and yeah. in need of guidance in that moment yeah. um, and it seems like good synergy with attorneys and therapists so yeah <laughs> yeah all... especially attorneys and you know it's funny because i i have had one client in particular that actually was an attorney and brilliant, very brilliant woman. And, um, but she didn't practice, you know, matrimonial. So she didn't know the nuances. Yeah, sure. Um, and it was very interesting because it kind of showed like, this is a really smart woman who understands the law, but it's her life. Sure. And she, she was a little lost, you know, right. how to kind of get to the next step. When you're a tree, it's hard to see the forest. Yeah. And that's, I think, you need someone to come in with a helicopter or a drone and look overhead and be like, yeah, okay, great this analogy. is what's going on down there. I see you and I see all this stuff around you. We're going to figure out a way forward. Okay, great. All right. I feel like I understand a lot about what you're doing professionally now. And I just have one question for you where we deviate from business. Sure. At the end here, I like to ask about your favorite things to do when you're not working. What okay. are you, what is your favorite hobby? or? So I really love to cook. Um, That's awesome. I enjoy cooking. And and um, last year, because we moved into a new house, um, and I started like really getting into growing a garden. So I grow like really uh, pretty nice vegetable garden. And so I just have a blast going out there and watching everything grow. And I always say like, I don't know if you ever saw the movie um, For Richer For Poorer with Tim Allen and Kirstie Alley. They, they get stuck in the Amish country and okay. he helps plant the corn. And then like after it's grown, he's like, I did this. I grew this. You know, and of course, like, you know, it's, yep. it's, it's nature and it's God. But um, it's such a really cool feeling like, wow, you know, I did this. I put this. So I love doing that. I also um, I follow a lot of different people, you know, uh, podcasts and, you know, different um, different types of um, I always love to increase like just my knowledge, especially like in the area like we we're talking about before, like with spirituality and yeah. physics and things like that. That's a really big, um, really like a nice way to, for me to unwind. Yep. And of course, you know, I have a dog and two cats and they keep you busy. They just kind of hanging out with them and my, my, my two teenage girls. Um, yeah. So okay. I'm kind of a homebody, you know, when I'm not, uh, 
when I'm not working. I get it. I that's awesome. I, I do a lot of like learning things on with, through podcasts and YouTube and and listening to interviews just like this one where I get to know about something that I didn't know yes. already. I find that that keeps me stimulated and inspired is to learn new things. If I'm if I'm only doing the same stuff over and over again, I'm not assimilating new knowledge. I get bored and I get you know like anxious and I don't feel yeah. inspired. So I, I try to keep learning new things. Great. All right. So thank you for coming down today and thank talking you. to us. I, I learned time. a lot. All right, awesome. I learned a lot about uh, how to strategize uh, specifically in this uh, area of divorce coaching that you're that you're focused on, which I think is needed. So thank all right, you. everyone can uh, reach out to you. We will uh, we'll put your, your green screen commercial at the end of this so they know how to get in touch with you. Terrific. And I'll just say thank you everyone for listening uh, to the Long Island Local podcast we've been here today with elisa valentino and we will see you guys next time hello i'm elisa valentino and i'm a life strategist and divorce coach i assist people working through the divorce process and then planning for their lives afterwards i'd love to have a chat with you if you're going through divorce i can be reached at 516-493-1742 my email is hitting the restart button at gmail.com and my website is www.hittingtherestartbutton.com.